And we are live. Good morning. Good Monday morning, everybody, as we enter into episode 3483 of the Survival Podcast. Today's episode is called, called Seven Common Causes of Empire Collapse. And today's show topic was chosen by a poll that I ran on X because, well, frankly, X has the best functioning poll uh, software or system or what have you. Uh, of all the social media that I use. Somebody on Noster needs to fix that, by the way. Um, it's either Iris or one of the other clients that has a polling feature, but people have to pay to vote. I don't, I don't think that works really well. So um, I used X and this topic won pretty heavily over the, the options were something about guns, something about gardens, something about empire collapse or something else. Uh, and this took well over 50% of the vote, spread, and the rest was spread out against everything else. Gardening came in uh, a strong number, too. So tomorrow we shall do something about gardening. But today, the collapse of empires. And these go well together uh, because you will see today that, uh, you know, at times there's a big correlation between the decline in the ability to produce food and the decline of an empire. But that's what we're going to talk about today. And I know there are people who literally bristle. Like I can feel your, your, your loathing hatred for me uh, through the interwebs. I can feel it. I can hear you typing angrily on your computer when I refer to America as an empire. And this is due to a disconnect. And it, it, this is going to sound unrelated, but I think it'll make sense if you if you let it sink in. And then when we go through the characteristics of empire and how America fills those characteristics today differently than some empires of the past, I, I, I think that it'll make a lot of sense. But there's an old saying, you don't want a drill bit, you want a hole, right? So the drill bit is a tool by which you obtain a hole. And so you, but you don't really want it. It's not like you want to take a drill bit and put it on a, a trophy case and say, this is my special drill bit. The reason you're seeking a drill bit is you need a hole of a certain size in the wall. Now, if you had another tool that created that same hole, then you wouldn't really care how the hole got there. As long as the hole got there in the, uh, the same or less time and the hole did the same function that you were looking for. And a lot of the things that hold up America as an empire today are like that. Just because the Romans or the Greeks or the, 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 the Ming Dynasty or the Mongolians or whatever, right, used a different tool to make the hole, doesn't mean we didn't also make a hole for the exact same reasons. So that's the angle I'm coming at today, and we're going to blow through sevens today. Like, I am, I, I am a numeric pattern guy, and I like things to be consistent. So I'm going to go through today, and I'm going to give you seven uh, ways that we can look at America today and say it is an empire. Then we're going to look at the seven commonalities. And this is like, if you go into a, a history textbook, either is the same, you'll find these seven commonalities of every empire that ever rose and collapsed, had all seven of these things. And we'll discuss how America has them today. And then we're going to go and have to round it out for a nice 21 day, right? Blackjack, um, black shirt on a jack, so blackjack. Uh, we will talk about seven things we can do to help protect ourselves from this crumbling empire that is crumbling. And I, I think if you have any doubt today that, like when you start listening to this, that America is an empire and in fact our empire is in collapse right now. Like it's not going to collapse. Collapses, that's the other commonality that's not in my list, right? I'll give you a bonus here at the beginning. Collapses are never overnight, they often appear overnight. Certainly when we're reading the flat text of a history book, it almost can appear overnight, really, because we can condense timelines. Like I said, it never occurred to me in high school when I was learning about the American Revolution that it was eight years long and what eight years meant to my life when I was 16. Like, it never occurred to me. Like, so when this whole shit started that we just covered in three weeks, I would have been eight. And when it ended, I would have been sick. Like, you condense these things. But... I guarantee you that every single person that was alive at the time and living in and benefiting from the empire they were part of when it collapsed, they never saw the collapse until it was so in their face and, effect, and I think more so affecting them directly. I think you have plenty of people in this country going, yeah, the empire is collapsing. It's already happened to me. I felt it along the way. And they have people that are 
you know, maybe because they're smart, maybe because they're lucky, lucky, maybe because they're born into certain families. Like there's all different reasons for having these bubbles around us that have protected us. So we're not dealing with what other people in our empire are. So we think, oh, everything's okay. Because the last thing we want to do is accept that everything's not okay. Because then we don't feel really good about it. And as I lead off today, we're going to talk about a few things. And one of those things is actually going to be mouses. Yes, mice. Mice and mouses are both correct. You can be mad at you, just like geese and gooses. Um, but we're going to talk about a mouse experiment called Mouse Utopia. And it should, in fact... Well, frankly, scare the shit out of you when you hear what happened to the mice in a mouse utopia when the social roles that each mouse fills, there was more like there was no more place for some of the mice. They didn't have any social role to fill anymore. And boy, does it sound an awful lot like today. And this experiment was done so long ago. It was the year I was born, 1972. Before we do that, let's go ahead and hear from our sponsors of the day today. Sponsor of the day, number one today, is Anton's Land of Biltong. I have a, a little bit of a, um, a quandary taking them as a sponsor because I really don't like to lead people into addiction. But some addictions are healthy. And I think an addiction to meat is healthy. Anton's Biltong is amazing. And you're talking to a person that was teaching you guys how to make biltong 15 years ago. I was doing episodes on how to make biltong, right? That's how long I've been talking about biltong. I've been making biltong before I made my first podcast. I learned about biltong from uh, Peter Hathaway Capstick in one of his books, and it became a lifelong obsession. Anton makes real biltong. That, that's, that's like the highest praise I can give. And I think if you look at it, you might think it's expensive, but realize you know he's selling half pound, one pound bags, things like that. Go compare it to people selling basically glorified beef jerky that is not Biltong on Amazon and see what you're really paying. Then remember that you get a discount if you're an MSB member as well and is extreme value there. I'm going to be talking to Anton in the coming weeks about doing something with him in correlation with our fall workshop this November. That workshop will be – I keep getting questions about this, by the way. It will be the week of November 11th. It will be the week of November 11th. It will run Wednesday to Sunday. As it always did, we've had one year that wasn't the case. It was last year. We made an adjustment for a staff member, and we won't have to make that adjustment for them this year. So anyway, check out Anton's Biltong. And as good as the Biltong is, the Dewars. Check out the dry sausages. Oh, my. I When I know, because, guys, I get about half of my sponsorship payment from them in product. And I so I get Biltong and, and Dewars sent to my house every two weeks. And when I know like my day is coming and the shipment's coming in, my mouth starts watering. Remember, remember the old show, uh, the old movie, one of my favorite movies at Christmas time, the Christmas story, one with the BB gun in it. And there's a part and they're leading up to the turkey. And they talk about how the old man's eyes would start to glaze over and all when he knew the turkey was coming. That's how I feel about my Biltong uh, shipments. If you give it a shot, you'll see why. Next up today, the Exit and Build Land Summit 4. Uh, with John Bush from Live Free Academy. Guys, really think about coming down to the conference. But I also want to point something out. I think I have failed to to be clear enough about um, as I've been promoting this. You can basically attend most of it virtually for free. Now, there's upgrades even to that where you get some additional presentations and some additional things. But you can see a lot of the presentations at no cost at all. All you have to do is go to... Uh, the Live Free Academy website. And you can use the link in the show notes below uh, if you're watching the video or in today's episode on the audio side, you can use that link there and get on over. And all I have to do is click on secure your spot and you can go from there. But I also wanted to kind of let John, since he has a nice video here, tell you a little bit about Exit and Build and what it's really all about. The entire system, government, mega corporations, the media is basically a big fraud. After COVID, uh, this pandemic, a lot of people woke up. They pushed too hard and caused a lot of people to start questioning the status quo. We decided let's put together an event, bring together people that want to homestead, that want to build community, but don't know how or don't believe in their ability to do so. We have the hippies and the lefties, and then we have the Ron Paul libertarians and the Rothbardian and the anarchists. This homesteading, regenerative agriculture, permaculture, 
living together, buying land cooperatively. That is the new path forward. All right, guys, definitely think about coming down and checking this out. And if you are going to attend in person, instead of just doing the virtual, think about upgrading to the VIP and getting you know access to the green room where the speakers hang out, uh, getting to go to the dinner and a lot of other cool add-ons for the VIP people. Uh, and know that I will be doing kind of a breakout session during uh, the, fir the, the first two days, the Thursday and Friday of the conference. Basically, I'm going to jump the line, get my lunch early, go off into one of the breakout rooms, and I'm just going to hang out for about an hour uh, both days, ask kind of an AMA in real life, and I think John's going to film that as well. So anyway, with that in mind, let's go ahead and dig on into uh, what we have to talk, to talk talk about today, which is the collapse of empire. And again, I understand, you know, despite my mocking of people like typing me angry emails and stuff, and, and guys, it happens. And there's literally times uh, where I can look at the email and read it, and I can I can hear the anger and the the it's a it's a thing. But I actually get why when someone who is a good person who loves their country who grew up here and feels blessed to have grown up here, and I do, when they hear that for the first time and what is in their head is what they know of empires from the past. If you're if you're an 80s kid, right, and, and I say empire, who do you probably see in your head? Darth Vader, right? Lord Vader and the emperor, the empire strikes back. Like, this is what our mind is. The republic is good and the empire is bad. But if I say Rome was an empire, you'll say, well, yeah. And if I say Rome was a republic, you'll say, well, if you're a student of history, you'll say, yeah, but it, it, it didn't stay a, 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 a republic. It became an empire. Well, it actually became an empire while it was a republic. Okay? I'm sorry. It's just the case. It's not like a republic can't be an empire, right? It's not like a democracy can't be an empire. In fact, most, most empires, at least, were partially democracies. Right. There's a dictatorship and there's an empire. Those are not the same thing. A lot of the dictatorships in the world never approach anything close to becoming an empire. Their dictatorship was about controlling things within their borders. I'm not saying they're good or bad, right? I'm just saying that that's what it really was. There's not a lot of dictatorships that were really able to muster the logistics necessary to have something we could call an empire. To have a place that all roads would have led to at some point in history. So, uh, and I, I'm going to pause and I'm just going to recognize this. I, I won't see everything in the chat, especially if you don't use the all caps formula. But Steven says, thank you, Jack. I became a whole Bitcoiner today after almost four years of stacking sats. Well, we're going to have one bullet point today where we will mention Bitcoin briefly. But congrats, dude. Uh, that just proves that it can be done by people that want to make it happen. All right. So. Before we dig into the things that identify America as a modern empire, I want to play something for you that I think when you hear it, you're going to start thinking differently about a lot of the weird, bizarre shit that's going around in the world today. I mean, there's times where I say to myself, how, how is this a thing? It, you know, like things like, uh, sex change operations for minors, right? Like, really? Like, how are we even having this debate? How is drag queen story hour something we're even willing to discuss? How is it that we will allow somebody like Brandon, and really it's Brandon's handlers, to destroy Title IX that was put in place to protect women and women's sports by allowing transgendered athletes to wash their penis in a sink in a woman's locker room and then compete against women as men, but they wear their hair long and have fake tits. Like, how is that even a thing? All this, like, and I am not a prude, and if you want to dress up like a woman and pretend to be one as an adult and go have sex with men or women or other people, to do or whatever you want to do, go nuts. I, I don't care. I'm not one of these people who wants to stop you from doing that. But how we can take that and insert it in ways that destroy scholarship opportunities for women. And then we say that we're pro-woman. Like, this is so bizarre. But when you listen to what I'm about to play you, 
And this was a utopia for mice. Mice. Now, this is not a direct analogy before anybody starts losing their mind, okay? But if you listen to this, you will see a lot of parallels. Let me play this, and then we'll come back, and we'll talk about it, and we'll move on to why I say America is, in fact, an empire today. Cannibalism, asexuality, and violence, a society that had collapsed. What's going on here? In 1972, John B. Calhoun detailed the specifications of a utopia designed for mice, built in the laboratory. Every aspect of Universe 25, as this particular model was called, was designed to cater for the well-being of its rodent residents, increase their lifespan, and allow them to mate. There was abundant food, water, and nesting material, the universe was cleaned regularly. There were no predators. The temperature stable. Paradise. Or maybe not. Four pairs of disease-free mice selected from the National Institute of Health's elite breeding colony moved in on day one. It took months for the rodents to familiarize themselves with their new world. Then they started to reproduce, and the population increased exponentially, doubling every 55 days. Those were the good times in paradise. Past day 315, more than 600 mice now lived in Universe 25, rubbing shoulders on their way up and down the stairwells to eat, drink, and sleep. Population growth slowed. Young ones found themselves born into a world with far more mice than meaningful social roles. Males faced a lot of competitors to defend their territory against. Many found that so stressful they gave up. Normal discourse within the community broke down, and with it the ability of mice to form social bonds. Lone females retreated to isolated nesting boxes on penthouse levels. Other males, a group Calhoun termed the beautiful ones, never sought sex and never fought. They just ate, slept, and groomed, wrapped in narcissistic introspection. Elsewhere, cannibalism, asexuality, and violence became endemic. Mouse society had collapsed. On day 560, the population peaked at 2,200 mice. A few mice survived past weaning until day 600, after which there were few pregnancies and no surviving young. As the population had stopped regenerating itself, its path to extinction was clear. All right, so there's that's about half of the video, and I don't want to take up that much of today's show uh, with the video. So we're gonna we're gonna call it there. But I think that's enough to to uh, to help make the point about what's going on in the world today that I wanted to include that uh, for. So let's talk about it from a, just a couple different analogs that we see here. Now, they were definitely going on a population concept with these experiments. And mice are not humans and not, not everything's the same. But what I, what I see coming from the population explosion, because we would think of population straining resources, the land, all, all that stuff, right? Well, these mice never had to deal with that. They never had their fields go fallow. They were fed as much as they needed at all times. No matter how big the population got, they were fed. Or we would think about garbage, you know, and, and, and waste. But they were they kept everything clean, right? And, and, and they didn't get to a point where there wasn't enough space for the mice to exist. Like, there was enough room. And you would expect that when the population started to decline, it would eventually level out and then it would swing back up and up and down and up and down. And they would eventually kind of maybe come to it. But that's not what happened. But there's a very key important thing said here. When the number of mice exceeded the, the kind of slots for social meaning, like jobs to be done, things to fulfill, when we got to the point where it was Marxist utopia, Everybody is Star Trek, right? We have replicators 
and your mouse, mouse pellets will just be replicated for you and everything will be good. And when you, when you want your room clean, you just say computer clean room. And then the transporters just beamed all your garbage into space and, and spread the, uh, the molecules out so they could be reconstituted to something else. Like it's perfect. Not only did it eventually stop increasing in population and decline, when it went into decline, it went to extinction. It went to extinction. I'm not saying we're going to go to extinction because we can think more than a mouse. But I want you to think about some things in here. Some of the male mice decided it was no longer worth competing for women anymore or territory and said, fuck it, became the beautiful ones, worried about making their hair perfect and shit, and just went off and ignored everybody on their own. There's a whole movement that's exactly that among men today, met gal, men going their own way. Tell me it's not a consequence of society. What about the female mice that said, I don't want to have kids anymore, moved up into a penthouse, slept all day, and didn't give a shit about what was going on? Does, does, does that sound like a lot of your like women that are in their late 30s trying to convince you that they really know they made the right decision about having kids? Now, again, I don't tell other people how to live their life. I think there are some women who will be happier in their life, life if they remain childless. But I think they're a minority. I think they're a minority, and I think that they've been convinced that's not true. But I think that when they get to the point where they realize, like, it's never going to happen now, it's too late, I think we have started to see that there's a lot of regret that comes with that. I don't know, guys. I just see a tremendous number of parallels here, asexual behavior, gay sex behavior. Like, all this shit happened in a perfect mouse utopia where every need was seen to. And this experiment was replicated in multiple ways, multiple times. It always ended the same horrible way. Now, the guy that designed it just points some things out. I don't want to be an Alex Jones guy. You know, They're turning the frogs gay, man. I'm telling you, right? The frogs are kind of turning. Well, they're not really turning gay. They're they're changing sex is what they're doing. Um but the guy that did these experiments said that we should not directly correlate mice to human behavior. And I agree, but I think we can learn from this and that the parallels are so striking. And note at the time that he said that it was a long time ago. It's 35, 40 years ago. I wonder what this man would say if he was still alive, because he's not. If he looked at 2024 and compared it to his experiments. He might be like, holy shit, I was writer than I thought I was. But let's, uh, or more correct, I don't think writer is a word. All right. Anyway, moving on from there, I want to, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I have to do the same thing I advise my guests, not get sucked into the chat. Why do I say that America is, in fact, an empire? Well, I'm going to I'm gonna go through these bullet points fast, then we'll go back through them and do a little explanation of each one. Because I think, this is pretty self-explanatory, so we're not going to spend the bulk of the show on it today. But here are seven characteristics of past empires going all the way back to the beginning of written history and all the way forward to, like, the British Empire, right? And leaving us out because we're not an empire, right? Okay. One is economic dominance, military presence globally. Now, before there was globalism, that was, like, to the known world, right? Military presence everywhere. Cultural influence. Hmm. So um, empires have an undue cultural influence on other nations and other regions throughout the world. Uh, political and diplomatic influence and will be a key player in international institutions. Yeah. Technological leadership. Control over the global commons. What are the global commons? Well, those would be like all the areas and territories and things that are not directly under the control of a single entity, like international waters, space. In our world today with technology, it would be the internet, et cetera. So they have more control over global commons than maybe the, 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 the population center that is where the headquarters is would seem to make sense, right? Like 5% of the people having 90% of the influence. And we're not talking about the elite here. We're talking about the empire itself. Like you're included in that number. Uh, and along with soft power. That even the empires of old that wielded the sword and the chariot to get their will, they also often used a great deal of soft power in setting up vassals. Now, you know, if this show was only 40 minutes long, I would just leave it at that and so that 
that pretty well explains it. But let's just go through them again a little bit and look at some things that are going on in the world today. So one of the first or the first item on the list, and again, this is textbook level stuff here. This is not my opinion. This is like scholars around the world agree this is what an empire looks like. So the first one is um, military. Actually, I screwed it up, but we'll, we'll just go ahead and roll with it. Military uh, presence globally. So what's on your screen right now, if you're watching the video, is a map. And on that map is U.S. military installations around the world. And every red dot is some sort of military institution. And you can see that the only really big areas where there's not red dots are, think about the names I'm about to give you, Brazil, Russia, India, and China are the large land masses with no red dots and a few pieces of Africa. Uh, and that's about it. We've got military bases all over the EU, all over especially Central Africa, all over the Middle East, all over Asia Pacific, except for China and you know North Korea. We have military installations in Cambodia, uh, Bhutan, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, Guam, all over there, all over Australia. We have, in fact, 750 bases in 80 countries. There is, there is no power on the planet that's even close to 10% of that for a military presence. And we're smart about how we do this. And it kind of, these all fade into each other and have overlaps, like a Venn diagram. And so we use some soft power here, too, because a lot of our military bases don't have a lot of U.S. military personnel. What they have is a lot of U.S. military-owned weapons and equipment and ammunition and housing for the local soldiers, right? And so we go into a place and we say, we'll put up an American air base here, but don't worry, there'll only be like 150 U.S. servicemen there and a few jets and some stuff like that. But we'll use those guys to train up your guys really good so that you can defend yourself. And then you're part of the empire, right? They don't say empire, though, right? They're one of our allies, even though we don't have an alliance formally, right? We just have this military installation. So if somebody jacks with you, we'll jack with them back, right? And you'll be more stable and more secure. And there's some perks that come with this. But we have 750 bases in 80 countries. So I'm going to say uh, military presence globally, we can effectively say we, we, we tick that box off. Uh, no questions asked. Anybody that says we don't just doesn't, doesn't want to admit it. Like we have a global military presence. In fact, our military will tell you they're very proud of our global military presence and how important that it is that we have one. Next, uh, economic dominance. So the graphic I have on your screen right now, real simple to understand, infographic, 24.42% uh, of the global economy is U.S.-based. So for every dollar of commerce that occurs in the world, about a quarter is the U.S. dollar and U.S. influence and U.S. money. And this is not just us being the global reserve currency. This is our power, our economic power, the economic power of America spending around the world. And why would we not? We print more money than any other country, and we actually have more resources than just about any other country. I'm talking about real resources. Like, People say well, the resource-based economy is the way to go. They watch some socialist bullshit about it. All economies are resource-based. There's no such thing as an economy that's not resource-based. And, and we know that because when we try to print money to solve a problem that's a resource problem, we don't necessarily get more of the resource if we're actually out of the resource, right? So all economies at their core are resource-based. But we definitely have economic dominance. The, when, when you look at a country like the United States, accounting for a quarter of all spending. And our closest competitor in that realm is China at 16%. And their population is something like 1.7 or 1.8 billion. And our population is about 300 million. If you put it on a per capita, there's nothing else in the world that's even remotely close to the economic influence that we have around the world. And that is one of the key components driving the concept is, 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 as a, is a power sorry about that, is a power, an empire. If they have this massive economic dominance in the world, the, the power that comes along with that is such that you can only have that much power if you are an empire. I mean, there's other very, very, very rich countries, but they're totally not empires. They're totally not empires. And 
Hence, they do not have that sort of global economic dominance. Next, uh, how about cultural influence? We have global influence around the world in places where they literally hate us. And here's what I mean. Every single person has seen some video of, you know, people in some, let's say, a Middle Eastern country that hate America, but they're wearing Nikes. They're wearing, you know, an L.A. Lakers or some shit jersey, and they're listening to American rap music. And if, if they're asked, their favorite movies are all from America. That's where they don't like us. So think about what we do. We have massive cultural influence throughout the world. The, the, the two biggest pieces of like black market currency you could have had in Moscow, Russia in 1985 were what? Levi's jeans and Marlboro cigarettes. We have this massive social influence throughout the world. And again, I'm not even passing, I want something to be very clear. I'm not passing judgment on any of this as to it individually being good or bad. It's certainly beneficial to us right now. I'm talking about today about the way things are and the way things have been in the past when empires collapse and what it looks like when the collapse comes. There's no, there's no morality judgment here at all in this section anyway. I will always morally judge people that think it's okay to sexually alter a child. Right? I don't have, but when we're talking about this stuff, this is just, this is just, reality, right? We also have political and diplomatic influence. That's one of the key drivers to empire. We're a key player in every international institution out there. And even in places where they try to make it look like, well, it's somebody else. We're still the ones really calling the shots. Klaus Schwab, right? World Economic Forum. He's German. It's easy to cast a German guy that dresses like a Bond villain as the bad guy. Do you really think he can do anything without the massive multinational presence of U.S.-based corporations inside his, his, his group? And who do you think, who really has the power? In any relationship, who has the power? The hand that gives the money, not the hand that receives, because the hand that does the giving is always held higher. Influence being bought, that is part of creating vassals. So we have like this one-off relationship, even where it looks like maybe it's not a U.S.-based thing, it's, it's all U.S.-based money. Because again, 25 cents on the dollar spent is U.S. controlled currency. So I, I think we tech that box, no problem. How about technological leadership? For all the talk about how advanced like uh, engineering and math and coding and all that shit is in Japan and China and, and the Far East, and all, they're still just ripping off everything that we actually come up with. Now, on the manufacturing side, you know, if it wasn't for South Korea and Taiwan, Half the shit in the, on the planet wouldn't work right now because we can't build our own freaking chips, but we have the ability to. We're about to actually move in that direction. That's why we have the largest manufacturer of chips, Samsung, building a facility to manufacture chips in Austin, Texas right now. That, that's why that's happening, because this is one of our weaknesses. This is actually one of the places that we seem to be actually looking at the problem and going, hey, Maybe we should have a solution to the problem instead of talking shit to other people. However, I don't know that it's enough, and it doesn't seem like we're doing it in enough places. But we definitely are the technological leaders of the world. We, And especially when you look at it again, like people say, look at the technology comes out of India or China. Okay, the two of them together are over 3 billion people, right? In fact, it's close to four, I think. You can do the math for me if you want to. But when we turn around and look at the United States and we have a little over 330 million people, and yet we're the technological leader everywhere, and you do that on per capita, is that organic and natural? Or is it some sort of emp empirical advantage, right? The empire's advantage in being able to suck in. See, this is another thing about empires. It's not on my list. But if you think back, what did the British Empire do? It spread out all over the world. It extended its influence all over the world. But it would take the best and brightest back to London. It would also take a lot of like, we need to have, you know, Indian takeout in or takeaway, as they call it in England. So let's bring back some cooks and all. But they brought the smartest people under their umbrella. What, anybody remember a little thing called Operation Paperclip? Huh? You, know, you took the smartest Nazi scientists, gave them clemency, brought them to America, put them in positions of power. Right. If you want to go back, go back and look at how many of the leaders of the NATO alliance, like the top dog in NATO in Europe, 
were former Nazis from the 1960s up to about the 1990s. Go ahead and look it up. Right. All I'm saying is that we have this ability to have this massive political and diplomatic influence. And why wouldn't we when we can go into a country and go, hey, looks like you have shit in your streets. Would you like us to make it go away? Sign here. And where we're going to get the money, we're going to print it off the backs of future generations in the form of debt. And no nation has ever been able to do it at the level that we have. So why wouldn't we have them? Moving on, how about um, control over the global, global commons? I'll tell you who, who controls the oceans of the world and gets really pissed off when anybody challenges it for a microsecond, the United States of America. Our Blue Water Navy is the most powerful Navy that's ever existed. It is a, I don't care what they say about advancements by the Chinese. And it's not that we're not vulnerable. This whole thing's about being vulnerable. I'm talking from a pure power projection. Like the Chinese Navy is dog shit compared to the United States Navy. And that's our closest competitor in that world. And, and the British Navy's somewhat impressive still, but nothing like they were. But everything they have is because of us. And, and, and everything they don't have is because they rely on us. And don't think otherwise. So the global commons, like now we're talking about the tragedy of the commons at a global level. Space is a common area. I'm talking about outer space, right? We have complete dominance and control of space. We were the first people to put together a space force. Everybody wants to dog shit on that because Trump, Trump, Trump. Let me tell you something. Trump did not create space force or come up with the idea. It was sitting there ready to go, and it was something you got to put his name on. And that's And that's reality because... I know people involved inside Space Force that will tell you this was coming a long time. It's really a project that came out of the Air Force, um, much the way the Air Force came out of the Army Air Corps is, is really what happened there. Um, but again, since the orange man's involved, we'll attack it. Uh, and then how about soft power? And, and soft power is just mafia, good old mafia, right? Good old mafia tactic. Hey, you know, we could do you a favor. You do us a favor. If you don't do us a favor, maybe something bad happens to you. That's soft power. Soft power is here's our money and what we want. And if you do what we want, not too bad will happen. But if we don't help you, something bad could happen. I don't know what. Right? So it's just basically us being a global mafia. And that's what we are. Like, you, is there anybody here in this live chat? I want to make sure. Going to tell me that there's any one of those boxes. Again, this is textbook level characteristics of an empire from the past. Slightly modified to fit the technology of today. Is there a box we don't tick? If there is, let me know, and I'll I'll keep an eye on uh, on the chat, and we can come back to it. But I think that most of us would agree we've ticked them all. So then I said for today's show, let's put together the seven most common things that empires had going on at the time of their collapse that led to their collapse. And again, this is this is textbook history. This is something no historian is going to disagree with. They might disagree with whether or not we match the past, which I think is foolhardy, but they're not going to disagree with the things that caused empires to collapse in the past. Number one, financial breaking points. Financial breaking point. Go to usdebtclock.org and look at us heading straight on into $35 trillion in debt. $35 trillion. Like, this is a number so big, your mind literally cannot rock it. It, it, it can't. It, it, a trillion is a thousand billion, and a billion is a thousand million. So it's a thousand, thousand million per trillion, and there's 35 of them. There is no world. There is no scenario. There is no place in which the United States can pay that debt off. It does not exist. It is impossible. And in fact, it would destroy what we have left of our economy if we tried to do it under the current system. That, that system literally needs to be ripped apart. But at the same time, we have a Congress that just sent $60 billion to Ukraine. When about 80% of the American people are like, don't do it. Then they turn around and tell you that the American people are behind this, that they want this. Like we have people laying in the streets, ODing on fentanyl, and we're sending billions. This is real money, like this counterfeit money, but real money in quantity to Ukraine for a war that's already lost, a, a country that's already lost half a million men to this war. We're sending more into cannon fodder and we're spending money to do it. And that is not, you know, as bad as it seems, it's, it's a tiny amount of the money that we piss away every year. We are at an economic breaking point. I don't know how you could ever make the case 
that financially we have not extended ourselves well beyond what we can actually live up to. Understand how credit-based economies work. We get a thing now and we pay for it later. This assumes that the money will exist to pay the bill eventually. The money will not exist to pay the bill. And every time we print money to pay a bill with, we devalue the existing money. Basic inflation. This is why today you're going to the grocery store, you're spending $200 and you, you come home and you go, it just seems like yesterday that I could go out and spend 40 or 50 bucks and get at least this much food. You're not hallucinating. It is real. I know the TV told you not to pay attention to it. Don't believe your own eyes. Don't believe your own checkbook. It's real. And it's only going to get worse from here. We, we've come in three years, just three years. And it ain't because real estate's booming, right? It, there's a piece to it that's appreciation of real estate, which is really the devaluation of dollars, but it's economic policy. You need to make 70% more money today than you did in 2021 to buy the same house. To basically, to pay for the same apartment, the number is pretty consistent, actually. Right? The only people that aren't doing it are the ones that locked in prior to that time. Even with rentals, a lot of people have been able to, they can, like, like by agreement, they can only raise the rent so much per, you know, renewal of lease or whatever. But there's, I know people, frankly, that have been thrown out of the house that they rented for 10 years. Like, the, like their lease is up and they're like, okay, we want a new lease. And the landowner's like, get, get out. Because they can make so much money selling the house or they can renovate and release and make so much more money, they're throwing tenants out. This happened to my own sister. So don't tell me it's not real. So we are definitely at a financial breaking point. How about in, internal division or power struggles? Divisions weak, weaken political stability. A house divided cannot stand. Has there ever been a time in history that America has been more divided than today? I say that the division today makes the division during the civil rights movement of the 60s look like kindergarten. Honest to God. There's not a place that we can divide it that we are not divided. I watched a retarded Democrat, legitimate Democrat uh, ad, political ad today. The girl and her mom are heading for the Alabama border. Anybody else see this? Right? They're heading to the Alabama border. And, a, and of course, he's a hick, redneck cop, right? pulls her over and makes her take a paternity test because they're running for the border. They're like, Mom, I think we're going to make it. I mean, and they just make all the characters in this to be Southern stupid rubes. Who's behind it? Gavin Newsom, right? Now, this is not political or like me attacking the left. This is how stupid we are. This is how divided we are. They wouldn't make that ad unless it would work on some people. And if it works on anybody, we're, we're screwed. Like the level of stupid you have to be to fall for something like that is ridiculous. And don't don't get all comfortable if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm a diehard Trump supporter. I agree. Yeah, well, I got shit to say about you, too. I won't get into specifics, but we have this level of stupid that's ingrained in our society from top to bottom across all demographics. And it's a very simple thing to understand. Once you get into political tribalism, you have to justify the stupidity of your side. It takes it's very few people that won't, that'll say, nope, I'm not going to do this. There's very few people say I won't play the game. I posted something. I don't remember what it is right now. Oh, it was uh, somebody posted a thing about Biden. Now, you know me. I love to kick Brandon in the face. He deserves it. All right. But as this email is, or not email, it's like a meme and it's like, uh oh. Uh-oh, boom, right? All this stupid freaking political tribal nonsense. He's in trouble now. And it's like, guess who started taxing Social Security income in 1983? Senator Joe Biden. Uh-oh, Biden did it. And I simply responded with, and yet who was president that signed off on that law? Who was the president that signed the bill into law that started taxing the, the, the Social Security wages of America's retirees. Well, that would be Ronald, Ronald Reagan, wouldn't it? And somebody said, somebody said, Jack never misses a chance to punch right. And I'm like, left, right, center, I don't care. I punch anybody in the face who needs to be punched in the face. Do you know how unusual that is? It really is. No, we we are completely at a point of internal division and power struggles. And the more absurd 
camps become, the more this becomes reality. And I, I don't think it's conspiratorial to say that I think there is a controlling group of people who understand this dynamic, who are fanning the flames that want the American empire to fall. Because how do you create a global society when you have an empire that resists globalization? And the answer is you can't. You have to bring everybody down to where everybody needs each other. And I think that's the, the, the view behind it, right? And, and that has proven to be equally disastrous. And it's just a new form of empire that eventually goes through its own cycle of decay. How about this one? Environmental changes in famine. Climate and famines disrupt economies. Climate, he's talking about climate change. Well, I'm talking about climate. I'm talking about empires of the past. I'm talking about the Mongolian Empire. I'm talking about the Roman Empire, the Grecian Empire, right? The Spartan Empire. I'm talking about empires that have existed, you know, thousands upon thousands of years ago. I'm talking about empires that existed prior to Jesus walking the earth. And I'm talking about empires that were as recent as the British Empire and our current U.S. hegemony empire. I'm talking about all of them together. So this is not about anybody's bullshit pet thing on TV. The reality is when you start to have climate stress, i.e. you have droughts, entire empires have collapsed on droughts alone. The primary, not the only, but the primary driver of the collapse of the Egyptian empire was a extended long duration drought on top of their really shitty agricultural practices that we'll get to in a minute. So yeah, we we definitely have environmental changes. And, and what people would say is, well, Americans are not starving. We don't have famine in the traditional sense, but we have to modify to the current situation. No, we have 400 pound people that are nutritionally deficient and they are starving for nutrients. D to tell me we don't. Tell me we don't have that very thing and tell me we don't have starving people in America and tell me that some of the starving in the world isn't based directly on the way that we've caused it and tell me some of that starving isn't within the boundaries of our empire. You know, go back and think of how many places we exhort influence over and tell me that none of those places have people starving and having famines. Go back to that, that uh, map that I put up for you with all those red dots. Tell me none of the places those red dots are dealing with that. So we have this problem too. And if you're not making sure the citizens of your vassals eat, eventually your vassals say, why am I this nation's vassal? Why don't I go do something with somebody else? Right? Sooner or later, governments stop worrying about just maintaining control. And they start to actually solve problems because when they realize I'm going to lose control, like no matter what I do, I'm going to lose control. Then they actually try to fix the problem at that point. But it doesn't mean they won't cut bait with us, right? Even if they're unable to fix it, they'll still cut. They'll cut bait and they'll leave. And they'll find somebody else whose arms to run into. Like, I don't know, maybe a great big country. You know, if you're a Central African Republic right now, the, the case that is being made to you by Russia sounds pretty good. We want you as trade partners. We don't want a military presence in your location. Just get out of bed with these people and we'll do business with you and treat you with respect as equals. Now, whether it's the truth or not, it starts to sound pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, I don't trust any government. You know that. But if, if I'm sitting in chat or, you know, why don't you look up what's going on with about 1,100 U.S. forces in Niger right now, okay? You haven't heard anything about it. Take five minutes to research it. We have basically a little over 1,000 U.S. service members stuck in Niger right now because Niger is pissed at us for this very reason. So we definitely have a problem with environmental changes and famine and being pushed out of our own empire due to it. Uh, other nations are simply tired of living with less. And whether we're the cause of it or not, they feel like we are. Why are you telling us what to do? We can't feed our own people. Get out of here. You just gave this asshole that used to dance around naked and play the piano with his penis $60 billion and we're starving. And what do we get out of this relationship other than you get to have a military base in the middle of our country? Next, epidemics and diseases. Disease outbreaks diminish population and functionality. Now, what we think of with this is things like the Black Plague, the bubonic plague that wiped out entire civilizations. You know, if something kills 25, 50, 70 percent of your, your, your people, your empire is going to collapse. But we have modern diseases. So 
I kick modern medicine a lot, and they deserve it in a lot of places, but they did do some good things. First of all, there is absolutely the case um, that despite what I might say about certain uh, stabby stabs today, so I don't get demonetized off of YouTube, vaccinations as a thing work. There's plenty of them that have actually rid us of diseases that in the past just wiped out entire populations. Smallpox would be an example. And those of you that say that's not the case, you're in denial of reality. I don't have time for it. We also developed antibiotics. And so what was once the scourge of mankind, the bubonic plague, is easily treated with something as simple and cheap as penicillin today. So we solved a lot of these acute illness problems. But just like the mice, when we tried to create a utopia, things begin to devolve from a health standpoint on the other side of it. And what we've created, you know, what is the epidemic disease in America and our, our connected empire vassals today? Well, one of them would be type 2 diabetes, which is really metabolic syndrome. It's just one of the many manifestations of metabolic syndrome. So we have a nation, more than half of our people are not metabolically healthy, more than half. If that doesn't qualify as an epidemic disease... I don't know what does. And remember, all of these all of these overlay like a Venn diagram, right? So if you are at a financial breaking point, point one, and you're trying to pay for everybody's health care, and you have created by lifestyle something that afflicts at a major cost uh, to the financial side, half the people that are in the population, then you have a real problem, both from a health standpoint and a financial standpoint. You see what I mean? So let's look at something like smallpox or something with a high death rate, any disease with a high death rate. So the person gets sick and then they die. And it's this is going to sound, I don't know if that's true or not, but I am going to put it up anyway and say that maybe it is. Paleo Pub, he says 88% are metabolically unhealthy. I guess I'd have to know what that bar really means. Uh, cause if, if anything out of like a one C more than one point higher than it's or one tenth of a point higher than it probably is true, but let's say it's 50% and low ball. It's still a catastrophic problem, but this is going to sound heartless, but if somebody gets sick and dies, it's not really that big of a burden to society unless they're like the person that knows how to run all the nuclear reactors or something. Okay. The person was here. Now they're not, I know their loved ones will miss them and everything, but the cost is not that high. Right? The family bears the burden of cost to put them in a hole in the ground or cremate them or whatever. And if they were sick in a hospital for a week, they were sick for a week, and there's as much money extracted as they can for that one week. What is the economic burden of a person who lives 25 to 30 years with type 2 diabetes getting dialysis twice a week to survive? What is the economic burden of that? And then think of every other condition connected to obesity and, and the lack of metabolic health in the country. What is the ongoing cost of chronic health epidemic versus acute health epidemic? Acute, acute health epidemics are the curve, right? Flatten the curve, right? They come through, you get a big spike, and it's over. And maybe it comes back, maybe it doesn't. And usually what happens is as, as epidemics and pandemics move through society and people develop adaptations to them and immune response to them, each time that thing comes back, it's less, 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 less. See, history is how I knew not to worry about COVID. Didn't matter what anybody told me. I said, this is, and you guys were around. No, I'm like, this is all bullshit. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Like what the governments do that I can't say, but the, the disease itself is a non-event. And now it's pretty hard to say that it isn't right. Like, because I don't know. When's the last time you worried about it? If you're not mentally ill. Well, how did that all change so fast? Well, because it never was. They just stop scaring you with it, and enough people stop believing in it for the illusion to control them anymore. But we are 100% in the middle of an epidemic level health crisis throughout our entire empire. Again, when you have 350, 450 pound people who are seriously, there's this whole life, and then you have the nonsense go back to division, healthy at any size. Well, you have to be an idiot to think you're healthy. Right. These people that like they can make their finger disappear into their elbow because their fat roll on their elbow point is that fat. You're not healthy. But yet we'll divide people and say, oh, they're beautiful. They're wonderful. There's no reason they can't have a long, healthy lifestyle living that way. No, no one thinks that when you look at 
let's say a dog, and he's so fat, his his you know looks like toothpicks sticking out of his bottom, that that dog's healthy. Well, if the dog's not healthy, neither is the person. So we tick that box. How about uncontrollable population movements? Again, this is not right wing ultra maga Jack Spear goes. I get accused of being as ridiculous as it is. I get that accusation daily, multiple times a day. I didn't make this up. This is again, this is textbook level. What causes empires to collapse? So this is straight out of a textbook. Uncontrolled population movements, migrations and invasions that destabilize regions. Really? Anybody even want to make the case that we're not dealing with uncontrollable population movement in the United States and in our various forms of empire throughout the world? Because I put the EU as part of our empire. Have you seen what's happening in Paris and London and Scotland right now with unfettered immigration? Do you think it's actually worse there in some ways than it is in the United States? It's significantly so because these nations are importing far more of this unregulated migration than we are per capita. In other words, our country is really big. We have a lot of places that are still broad, wide open spaces, and we have a lot of people. So the impact of 8 million people moving into a society of 330 million people is bad and significant. But if you have 2 million people moving into a population of, let's say, 50 million, that's a much bigger impact, right? That really wouldn't be. So let's say you got 4 million people moving in on 50 million people. It's a much larger percent of change. And so I'm not saying our problem's not bad. I'm saying there's other places where it's far worse, and those numbers are more skewed than that. Uh, especially when those nations that are importing those people are, are full-on welfare states that makes the freaking United States look like it's a libertarian country, right? And it's we're not. But, like, if you look at the wealth, the social welfare programs of places like Sweden and Finland and Switzerland and France and the UK compared to us, like, the level of socialism there is so beyond us. And they built those programs without the idea that we would have to pay for people who didn't even want to do anything except extract from them. I think we have a problem with uncontrollable population movements. How about failing states and increased warfare? Internal conflicts lead to collapse. Failed states. Failed states. Now, this could be vassals failing. So if your vassals start to fail, you suffer. If the, if the golden horde comes in and takes over your vassal, you lose it to them as their empire spans, yours contracts. But think about this in regards to states, lowercase s, in the form of a republic. Is California not a failed state? Oregon, Washington, Illinois, Massachusetts. Are these not failed states? I mean, when you have to pay three times as much to rent a U-Haul, to go from LA to Dallas as you do from Dallas to LA, you know you have a, you're looking at a failed state, right? So we have this open movement within the confines of our nation. And then we have these state borders and we have federalism. And we have states within the federation failing. But yet they're doubling down and they're they're able to maintain their existence at the expense of the states that are not failing. And they take all their bad ideas that cause their failure. And with uncontrolled migration, people move from those to new states. And you'll say, Jack, you, you said you're for that. I am to a degree. I'm not in denial of the consequences of it, though. That we are seeing even the states that are, you know, if we think of them as being red states, move more and more purple all the time. We're getting more and more of an amalgamation, right, across the whole thing being equal because cities are controlled by the federal government. And they have turned the entire educational apparatus into an indoctrination program. And you could say that's conspiracy talk, but all one has to do is just look at the product. What did, what did Jesus say? Judge a tree by its fruit? Judge a system by its output. How about that modern version of that? If you, What percentage of young people coming out of the current education system are completely left-leaning? And in the worst possible ways, not left-leaning as being anti-war. No, 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 we can't have that. We can't have that. We have to have war to maintain the empire, 
right? War somewhere is good for the economy. Didn't a couple different presidents make versions of that argument when entering war? A little war somewhere is good for the economy, right? Yeah, it's good. It's good for freaking Lockheed Martin's economy, Raytheon's economy. And then we have collapse of trade routes, disrupted trade routes, exasperate economic crisis. Now, if you go back into the past, that might be something like disrupting commerce on the Silk Road, right? And so you might say today, well, Jack, we don't really have that problem. No, we don't. No, we don't. So we're not reliant on our biggest global adversary for the raw materials to make our most basic antibiotics then. See, let's go back to my thing about you don't want the drill, but you want the hole, right? And we can flip that around and say, if the hole's there, the hole's there, no matter how it got there. And if the hole's a bad hole, like it's in the side of a boat, you imagine you're in a relatively small ship. You got like 30 people on board with you. There's a hole in the hole, right? And it's just, it, it, water is coming into the ship at a rate that you can just do the math and go, we have about 30 minutes before we go down unless we stop it, unless we fix the hole. And sane people would immediately identify, is there any way to fix the hole? And if there's not a way to fix the hole, then let's get the lifeboats out and get away before the ship going down sucks us down with it. Let's get as much resource and material because there's no land in sight, right? And you would worry about patching the hole. That's what you would try to do. And you wouldn't care. Like, But today, what would we do? We would argue how the hole got there. It was termites that live in the ship. It was rotted. It was, it's the fault of the multinational bigwoods that built the ship. This jackass over here shot it with a cannon. What it, like, and they would sit and we would fight while the ship went down. That's America. That's what an empire collapse looks like. There's so much of that social disruption we talked about that everybody fights instead of fixing the hole. It doesn't matter how the hole got there. It matters that there's a hole. Okay, so trade routes. It doesn't matter if a ship is sideways in the Suez Canal disrupting trade. It doesn't matter if the Iranians completely lose the plot and say we're shutting it down, we're mining everything, and we go to war over it and can't quite clean it up as fast as we want. It doesn't matter if like the, somebody blows up the canal, right? It doesn't matter if China simply says, no antibiotics for you, and just cuts it off. So we have supply chain disruption all over the planet right now, and certainly within our empire. And I would say of the seven I gave you, which is financial breaking point, internal division, uh, environmental change, epidemic disease, uncontrolled population, and failing states, collapsing of trade routes is the one that is, has the least effect on us right now. And I noticed that I just got kind of wiggy uh, there with my focus. So we'll see if that clears up. And if it doesn't, we'll try something else. Anyway, uh, moving on from there, I want to talk to you about, well, what do we do about all this? How, how do we protect ourselves in, in this? And you're going to hear a lot of things that you've heard me say. But what I tell you is in preparation for today, I went and extracted all of these points and then added to it. But all the points themselves come from agreed upon historical accounts. Like what did people do that did well? How did people survive the falling of empires? And I think it's interesting that so many of them align with what we teach here. Number one, diversify your investments. Spread your asset across classes and regions. So not only should you not have all your money in the dollar, you shouldn't have all your money invested in things that are tied some way or another to the American empire. So if you have some of your investments denominated in euros and euros, Europe is the EU is part of the empire, you really haven't created diversity. So we need diversity outside the region, outside the currency, and frankly, outside the system. So to me, the investment there is real land that's going to be very difficult for anybody to take from you, your tools, your knowledge, et cetera. But it's also going to be traditional assets that are very difficult to confiscate, especially if the person that wants to confiscate them doesn't know you have them, like silver and gold. That's why in spite of the fact that I am a Bitcoin maximalist, I have never shit on silver and gold. There is a value to silver and gold in that I can hold it in my hand and I can transfer it from one person to another. Silver for small things, gold for big things. 
I also think everybody out there should be investing in Bitcoin right now because Bitcoin will go nowhere if the United States uh, uh, empire collapses. It will still exist. It will certainly hurt for a while. Its value will decline. Maybe it might actually explode in value relative to the dollar. But if the dollar is becoming more and more worthless, will it really matter? I don't know. But I know it is the most unconfiscatable asset that has ever existed. Because silver and gold, I can hide it. But if you find it, it's pretty easy to take from me. If I have Bitcoin, I can literally say, here's the address. Go nuts. Go for it. Because people have done it. People have done it. And unless you are really good at guessing the right atom in the known universe, you're not getting it. So I definitely say make that a part of what you're doing. But you have to go beyond that again. To me, a garden right now is one of the – and that's why I'm glad that tomorrow is going to be a garden day. We're going to talk about gardening in some aspect tomorrow. That gardening right now is one of the best investments you can make because while the cost of food has gone up, the cost of production of food has not for the gardener. Now, you can say for the farmer it's gone up, and that's a different problem, okay? That is the denuding and degrading of our farmland and needing more and more chemical inputs to get the same amount of output and to an economy where the largest output we have is corn and more than 50% of it is used to make ethanol at a net energy loss, right? So that's our own doing, our own stupidity, our own shooting yourself in the foot. So yes, if you're a farmer farming 10,000 acres all mechanized, your cost of food production has gone up while your revenue in per unit out has gone down. I get that. But for a gardener, it costs me no more money right now for the head of broccoli that we will eat tomorrow night, our first head of broccoli from our spring crop, I'll cut that off tomorrow and we'll cook it, I don't know, with steak and asparagus or something. The cost of that broccoli production for me has gone nowhere in 20 years. In fact, it cost me less to produce it today than it did 20 years ago because my soils are more developed. My knowledge is higher. I can produce broccoli now for next to nothing. I'm literally growing food that costs me zero dollars, only a little bit of time and, 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 and energy. When you start saving your seed, you don't even have the cost of seed. Like my inputs that I purchase now are pretty much a little bit of Dr. Earth fertilizer, but like 20 bucks worth of that's good for a whole season. And that cost hasn't gone up. A little bit of um, stuff that's, uh, you know, you spray on stuff um, here and there, some mineral supplementation and all, but I really don't even use that much anymore. I probably should use it more than I do. The point is I don't need it. So that's why a a garden is such a great investment. I can make the investment today and it keeps paying dividends down the road. And it doesn't matter that China says you can't have, you know, this chemical that they use to make an herbicide. It doesn't matter that Russia can't or won't export urea for fertilizer. It doesn't matter that the cost of NPK 10, 10, 10 tripled. I don't care. And so you have to start thinking differently with your investments. The fact that I know how to cook is more valuable today than it was 10 years ago. One, because I'm better at it. Let's say I was just the same good as a cook, as a home gourmet cook, right? Today as I was 10 years ago. What is the, like, I, we do okay, you know? So I took my wife out Sunday. We went to this new Mexican restaurant. It was fantastic, but it was well over a hundred bucks. I can cook that meal for like $15 because I know how to cook. And, and that is pretty amazing, right? My ponds that are full of catfish are worth more than the day that I put them in because the fish are bigger and fish is more expensive now. So it's not just Bitcoin, gold, silver, real estate. It's what systems that are productive do you have? It's right where I started the show 16 years ago. I did an episode very early on, maybe a month in called, the first time I ever did it anyway, it was called From Home to Homestead. And going from the house as a liability that sucks your revenue away to an asset that produces for you on a daily basis. So we have to think differently with our investments beyond just, I want some stuff denominated in different currencies and I want some silver and gold. We need to invest in our own systems of production. And this is how people have survived historically. The people that can produce food did better than the people who could not. Because the people who produce food then become a source of food for what money is available or what other goods are available. And the thing is, anybody can do it and most people won't. So it's an opportunity, it's an investment. Uh, We need to build community ties. Now, again, this is textbook stuff. This isn't Jack's opinion, but boy, how much do we talk about building community? 
So there is historical precedence for this. You know, when I interviewed, I can't think of his name now. He was a guy that lived through the Bosnian conflict. And he talked about how in the very beginning, there were people that were very predatory while the war was going on, but they weren't part directly in the conflict. They were just stealing from people and all. And very quickly, people kind of ganged up in, in the best way possible. And once that happened, if nobody would have you, you were dead. Like if no one would take you in, and if you were one of those people that initially was going out and preying on others and you were known for you were you're gonna die because you had no source of protection and no source of resources. So even if the people that you had victimized didn't turn around and kill you, you were caught up in a conflict where eventually you're gonna get caught in the crossfire because no one would take you in. And people survive because of that level of community. When I've talked about anarchy, people say it never worked, it never like you don't study history then. Pretty much all of Eastern Russia, Siberia, right, was an anarchy at one time. There was a time when the railroads were being put out and it wasn't done yet. The Trans-Siberian Railroad wasn't done yet. And, and instead of like not everybody went to a gulag, like gulags were expensive to maintain. And you had to put people out there that you didn't necessarily hate to guard them because you had to trust the people that were in charge of them. Right? You had to feed the people that were there, even if they were mining salt or whatever. The gulag was a net loss to profit. Right, So unless the person legitimately posed a threat to come back and do you harm, it was easier. They would just roll the trains out there, kick everybody off the train and go, bye, see you. And they assumed that most of these people died, and certainly many of them did. But as like there's been a lot more development in Siberia than I think we know here in America today. And eventually, you know, the Russians go out there and they start finding these little settlements all over the place. And they're like, we're here to help. And the initial response from those people was get fucked. We don't, we don't need your help. We've, we've been fine for 70 years without you. Stay away. But that was, you, you know, who survives when you get kicked off the train in the middle of Siberia is you're heading into winter. People that have other people to help them. So build community. We're going to have to do it. I would start while times are good. If you can't build community while times are good, good luck doing it while they're bad. Just my thought. Um, develop self-sufficiency. Learn skills like gardening and home repair. Some bitch. What a great idea. Why didn't somebody else think of that? Now, this, is out of a, this is out of a history textbook about what people did to survive the collapse of their empire. And if you think about it, if you look at the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union collapsed, what remained as Russia, it wasn't like the people there didn't suffer when all those satellite republics broke away. They most certainly did. But the people that were not in Moscow, right, the people that were further east, the people that had garden allotments and all, they just did better. In many instances, they didn't even know, right? They knew intellectually, but I'm saying they didn't know that the rest of the country was actually in a bad way because they were able to just keep living life the way that they always have. There's tremendous records of that. Do you know there's people that when, uh, what was the place with, it just was in my head and slipped out now, the place where the, uh, the nuclear reactor melted down, right? And I don't know why that won't come in right now, but uh, Chernobyl, is it Chernobyl? All right. Um, there are people that, when they were all told to evacuate, they didn't. No, I'm not talking Three Mile Island. That's America. I'm talking about Russia, right? So when the when the, the nuclear reactor, yeah, Chernobyl went, went ate shit. There were like old people that were not like right at ground zero, but they were in the area that was considered dangerous and they were all told to leave. Well, you know, you only say that so many times. And then since everybody left, there's no one there to check. There's people that just stayed. I remember watching this movie, this old lady movie. It's like YouTube, uh, you know, YouTube documentary. This old lady, and she's making moonshine and shit. And, and they're asking her about the radiation and all. And she was like, I'm 89, and I'm drinking moonshine that I made myself in a still in my kitchen um, with my dirt floor. I don't care. I don't care. And so people that had skill sets were able to survive that in a complete abandonment of the area by their government. Now, I know some of you are like, well, I, I don't think anything could happen to me that would be better than my area being abandoned by my government. Think of what you lose, right? 
I agree, we would gain a lot. But I, then I want you to take a different approach. Look around you. Look around you, people that live around you. Now, some of you live far enough remote that you already kind of have that. You're out of this one. I'm talking about people like me. You live on the or urban rural fringe. Most of your neighbors are somewhat like-minded. But how much would they suffer if your government walked away from your county completely? And the answer is pretty damn bad. And then how dangerous would those people become to people like you after, let's say, six weeks, especially if they figured out no one's coming back anytime soon? And the answer, again, is very. The reason people were able to do it around Chernobyl was that pretty much everybody left, right? It wasn't just the government. Everybody left. So there were so few people left. Only the hardened people who knew what to do and didn't give a shit, right? Again, if, if I'm 85 and you tell me, you know, 10 years of exposure to this radiation could give you cancer and kill you, I care a lot less than when I'm 45. But how tough do you have to be to be 85 years old and live that life on your own or with a few people around you? No real young people to help you because the young people all all ass. But that's about having self-sufficient skills like gardening, home repair, moonshine making, all of it. Some bitch. Like maybe we've been teaching the right stuff all along here at DSP. I don't know. How about stay informed, monitor economic and political trends? You notice that every once in a while I do a show kind of like today, and sometimes it's even more like a timestamp show. And what I mean by that, my, my grandson, by the way, is about to start a podcast. And he's already doing some recording and all, and we'll have it out hopefully by this week, officially. It's going to be called Sports Noise, and it's about sports. And he's actually pretty damn, pretty proud. He's pretty damn good. And uh, I've been explaining this to him, like you can have time-sensitive or evergreen content. And so, you know, because it's a sports podcast, and he's a kid, and he's trying to find his feet, he's doing things right now like, you know, talking about the NBA playoffs or whatever, what happened in this game. And what I'm explaining to him is, that's great. But would you listen to somebody's podcast about the NBA playoffs today four weeks from now? And he's like, no, because the game's over. Yeah. But every once in a while, I do a timestamp type content. It's this right here. We have to pay attention to what's going on. I'm not going to live my life in fear of tornadoes. But when storms are coming, I'm going to see what the likelihood is that I'm going to face one. Because there are things I can do to give myself a chance to come out of it better off than had I not known at all. Ignorance is bliss until you get punched in the mouth. To paraphrase freaking Mike Tyson, right? Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? Well, you know, ignorance is bliss until, bliss until you get punched in the face by what you were ignorant of. So we do need to stay informed and know what's going around with no false beliefs that our knowledge of them has any impact on them. I mean, there are people, and it took me so long to figure out that there were so many people that this applied to. I would say it's probably half of people in America today are so daft at this point that they actually think if they stop watching the news, it's more likely that something bad will actually happen. As though their observation has any impact on reality. It doesn't. But it is good to know what's going on. There's shit going on all over in the world right now. And most people are blissfully ignorant, which will stay that way until they get punched in the mouth by it. I've talked about the, the BRIC alliance, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, right, for a long time. And people keep saying, like, it's no big deal. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's a direct threat to our hegemony and our empire. And I know people will say, but, Jack, you know, even though you're doing a show today, we all know that you're not fond of us being an empire. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not blind to what it has meant. And there's two ways for empires to end, Right. And you might think it's like peacefully or through warfare. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean. An empire can end because the people that run the empire and the people that are part of the empire decide they don't want one anymore. And they develop a strategy, strategy to extract the tentacles of the empire slowly across time in a meaningful way that matters, that gives freedom and autonomy to the former vassals and protects the interests of the people in the empire. Rarer than hen's teeth. It's possible, but I can. The closest example I can find is the breakup of the Soviet Union. And it still it didn't come that way. It was just that the Soviets themselves decided they weren't going to militarily use force to prevent the breakup. That's why it went. It was still miserable. 
So it wasn't a peaceful transition as in, we know we're going to do this. Let's do this as, as fundamentally correct as we possibly can, right? Because that's one way. The other way is kicking and screaming and gnashing of teeth all the way as everything is torn apart and people keep trying to cobble it back together. I know, we'll just break our empire into two empires. It'll be okay, right? The Eastern and Western Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is born. It'll be, it worked out really good, didn't it? Right? Like, no, it didn't work out. Like, it's those five stages of grief we talked about last week. You know, you start off with denial. It can't be true, too. It's anger somebody else did it, right? And then bargaining, and then depression, and then acceptance. But you can spend a lot of time in a spiral, anger to bargaining to depression, back to bargaining to anger to denial, and back and forth. In those, you can spend infinite amount of time until time runs out in those first four stages. That's why I teach getting to that fifth stage of acceptance so well, or so often, I should say. Next, emergency preparedness. Maintain essential supplies and plans. I don't think I need to say anything about that. The show's called The Survival Podcast. We talk about that all the time. You should store what you eat and eat what you store. You should be in a position that if your supply lines are cut off, that you know you're good for a month or two. That's a long time to figure out what to do next. Right? And, and people will say, it's got to be a year or it's nothing or anything. whatever you want, man. Whatever you want. But if, if most people in empires that fell apart had two months of self-reliance and some percentage of self-sufficiency, the, 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 the empire would have still fallen apart. But the transition would have been a hell of a lot easier on the people that suffer that are on the bottom. And it's amazing when empires collapse how fast people who are like in the middle or at the top can end up right at the bottom with everybody else. So this is for everybody, not just for, you know, poor people or whatever. Um, Builder of Castle says one month of food will save you from most bad stuff. And I agree. That's what I'm saying. Like 30 days to me is really easy to do. That's why I reckon. And you got to If you're going to have six months, you got to have one month first. Right. Then you get two. Then you get three. Like you, you build. Right. So I always teach just do a month. Get to where you know, like, I have enough food to feed my family and myself for a month and feed the neighbors a little bit here and there, right? And not have to eat the dogs and, and feed the dogs too. Then whatever you did to get there, just do it again. You got 60 days. That will insulate most people in this country from most of the things that will ever go wrong. Maybe not all of them, but most of them. And then we need to enhance our career flexibility. Today's day and age, you know, we're talking about transferable skills, remote work capabilities and things like that. But when I read this in history, it turned out that the guy that was a blacksmith that was only able to do blacksmith work and all his work came from work for the military and the empire collapsed, he didn't do so well. He didn't do so well. Now, he did better than the tax collector. Because if you're a blacksmith, there's other shit you can do. But if your primary revenue stream is tied to one thing, and that one thing goes, we don't want you anymore, or there's simply a change in technology where the military is like, we don't, like, how many blacksmiths work for the United States Army today? If you go back to certain times in history, like, armies traveled with blacksmiths as part of their support system. Do we have that today? No, because technology changes. So the more you can do in the more different areas, the more adaptable you'll become. Right now we talk about how we, we hire all these, you know, like Indians and Pakistani guys to do customer service for American companies. And we act like that could never possibly shift. Like it could never be the case that some Chinese company would hire you as an American because you're less expensive than Chinese labor in China. Because right now that's so the disparity is so much the other direction that can't happen. Again, just look at history. Some of the wealthiest empires in the world, today, those same locations are the most impoverished. There was a time that the jewel of the world was Egypt. Taking a look at it there lately and remove tourism because of the, the remnants of that society. And what would they have? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. So don't think that we can't end up on the other side of this because we can don't think that the wall that they want to build to keep Mexicans out today, and I'm not an open borders guy and a welfare state. We could have one or the other, not both, right? 
But don't think that wall might not be used to keep you in in the future, right? Because maybe they don't want you when the tables turn because tables turn. Oh, that can't happen to the United States. You know, I'm pretty sure there were a lot of countries in the world that when the United States of America was a backwater, didn't think that the United States would, could become in every measurable way the leader of the world, not just the free world. The most dominant force on the planet is the United States of America today. Can you see telling somebody in 1880 that that was going to happen? It took less than 100 years. We were the most powerful force in the world long before 1980. By the time World War II ended, that was pretty much a done deal. It was pretty much a done deal. So that was with a, that's a human lifetime, guys. That's 1880 to 1945. And, and honestly, most of the world would have laughed at you if you said it in 1900. 1900, the United States will become the most powerful force in the known world. 1945, it's true. I'm 51 years old. It's that fast in history when these changes come. They're slow. They're methodical. They're gradually. But when the actual shift happens, it's suddenly. Gradually, then suddenly, in the words of Hemingway. Next, um, improve your health literacy. I, I think this is, and, and again, this is people that knew how to look after themselves to service their own doctors, et cetera, have done much better throughout history. And our number one health problem in America today is nutrition. It's nutrition. And you guys know how I feel about carbs and keto and everything, but I want to explain something today. My militant stand about, like, if you're really going to fix your problems means you have the problem. So when somebody has, like I did in my past, metabolically jacked up themselves, you pretty much have to go hardcore keto carnivore, something in that realm, because you've jacked yourself up. So if you have someone that lived their whole life as an alcoholic, spent the last five years laying in a ditch, right, every night, somehow survived, got all kinds of problems and things like that, health problems and all, and they've been drinking every day and like the hard stuff, like complete alcoholic and whatever in your mind, qualifies as a complete, total, full-on alcoholic. Would you ever tell that person, you know what, if you would just keep your drink into, you know, a couple beers or glasses of wine on the weekends, everything will be fine. You'd say you need to never drink again. And the more they've damaged your body with it, the more that would be true. So if you haven't done that already, I've said this before, get rid of high fructose corn syrup, food with things you cannot pronounce in them right? All the chemicals, get rid of seed oils and all the preservatives and all the chemicals and all that bullshit. Go to one ingredient foods and put those together to make meals and keep your total carbohydrate consumption under a hundred grams a day, which is quite a bit. If you've ever lived on 20, you know how much that really is. You will be physically fine 90% of the time. There are metabolic differences in people I think specifically when you get into the world of type O, the ancient blood types, the more Neanderthal blood types, the more northern region blood types, the further north humans go or south, depending on, you know, distance from the, the further you get from the equator in the tropics, the more an indigenous society needed to rely on meat. And so over thousands and thousands of years, I think we did develop some genetic diversity that leads to some people do way better on that. And some will do just fine with plenty of fruits and vegetables, but more than hundred carbohydrates a day. If you understand what a carbohydrate is and there's no such thing as a slow carb or any of that bullshit, it doesn't exist. It's all made up crap to sell you bullshit. Then, you know, that's a lot of sugar and your body does not need that much sugar and it's not good to have it. And there's plenty of skinny fat people. They, they look pretty skinny, but the little pooch belly and you do their lab work, their A1C is through the roof, etc. No, that's not good. But most, most people, if you haven't already had a lot of years of screwing your body up again, cut down to hundred. And if it works great, and if it doesn't go to 75, but if it doesn't work, go to 50, you know, and, and you'd be surprised at how quick you can turn around your health. And the reason I'll stay with that 
is my main recommendation here is because there's no amount of, you know, uh, comfrey salve you can put on your body to make your A1C go down, right? Or your fasting insulin go down or your, make your insulin resistance, your hypoinsulinemia go away. It doesn't exist. There is no herbal anything. All this magic bullet thinking, like this group of people thinks they're going to take this combination of herbs and this group of people think they're going to take statins and both of them think they can go on the way that they've been going on. Your food is your medicine. So we need to improve nutritional density and quality of food and eat good food. And because science did such a good job with acute illnesses, we can get rid of the vast majority, not all, but the vast majority of chronic illnesses are directly lifestyle related. So we have to uh, approach that. That is not how it was explained in the textbooks, right? It was more about having traditional med medicine knowledge and things like that. But the people, if we go back to the time this was all about, they weren't living on high fructose corn syrup because nobody had figured out how to make it yet. They weren't living on high carbohydrate diets because indigenous societies do not. But we, what we do know about all the high carbohydrate stuff, every society that built its society upon annual agriculture eventually collapsed. And every single one extracted from the land more than the land could carry and denuded their farmlands. And they were any anybody who did it and became big by doing it had wonderful arable land or they wouldn't have been able to do it in the first place. Maybe they had to develop some sort of irrigation technology or something like that. Human powered pumps to move the water from the river up into the field. Sure. But the land had to be arable land or you could not have built a society, millions of people eating great. And everybody that did it suffered for it eventually. And the people that knew how to take care of themselves, feed themselves, medicate themselves and prevent illness in the first place did better in collapses than those that did not. Really simple to understand. My final thoughts here is, and I've been saying this for years, you can't stop this. You can't stop this. There's no getting out of this. There's no getting out of this. The way I described it a long time ago was you may as well climb, climb down into a gristmill, a couple of big Clydesdale horses, turning a, turning a spindle, and down in there we're grinding grain. And this is a big millstone, right? Hundreds of pounds. And those two huge horses are just going, choo -choo, choo -choo, choo -choo, choo -choo, grind, grind, grind. And, and the grist is coming out the other side. Well, stopping this, you might as well go down in there and, and, and put your hands up on the stone and tell the guy to slap the horses in the ass and say you're going to stop it. You're going to get rubbed out. Like, it's not even going to be a thing. It won't even slow down. Until you ex get to that acceptance stage of the five stages of grief, you, you might as well be doing that. Because then you won't do all the things you do control that you can do to be ready for this. You won't be putting your health in order. You'll still believe that they're going to 3D print you a liver someday or some shit, right? They're not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Nobody listening to me right now is ever gonna get a 3D printed organ ever. Maybe some form of artificial heart or something like that that's just mechanical. But like this idea we're gonna start 3D printing pancreases and livers and shit. No. No. You you better treat your body like every single one of your parts. There's no spares. Because in, in in essence, there really aren't. And by the way, those are like, well, look at all the, the transplants we do today. You know, I was really surprised. At one point, I started asking myself, like, I watch these medical drama TV shows and shit because my wife likes them. And, you know, this person, like, they're, like, 28 years old and they get a new heart and they have a big, long life ahead of them. I started wondering to myself, self, how long do these transplants last? And occasionally you get the outlier that it really is crazy. It's, like, 40 years an organ lasts or something. There's, I think, one, the longest transplant ever was something like 61 years. And the person died of, like, unrelated conditions eventually. But a lot of organs have a typical lifespan once they're transplanted of five to 10 years. It's considered a success. If you don't die in the first six months, it goes as a gold star for the surgeon and the medical team that did it. So you better start acting a little bit closer to reality when it comes to taking care of yourself. Have a plan. Build community. Don't pretend this stuff does not exist. Right? Don't pretend that this stuff doesn't exist. Because it does, and it's bearing down on us, and it's bearing down on us hard. And we are reaching what I would consider an acceleration point in the cycle. 
What I've always said is that these things happen very slowly. And then they seem to happen overnight. And I can explain that with another analogy. And some of you guys that have jumped out of perfectly good airplanes with a parachute will understand what I'm talking about here. Especially if you did it like you don't have one of those air brake special civilian parachutes. Like you got an old you know T-10 Charlie or a T-12 Bravo military chute. You go out of the plane, the shit opens up, it jerks your balls up into your throat, you know, when you have that shock of the opening and you're floating. And you feel like you're barely moving. <clears throat> you have to actually look at the ground and determine if you have any drift rate, because if there's other people around you, you're drifting at the same speed in the same air column. Your relative motion is zero. So you look down and that way you can understand how to prepare yourself to land. Because if I'm sliding this way, I want to slip against that and slow down that motion by pulling certain risers. doesn't stop it, but it slows that drift. But you look, they tell you, do not look down. If you look down, inevitably, you will take your feet apart. And there's a saying in Airborne, right? Keep your, your feet and knees together and you'll live forever, right? But if you open your feet when you hit the ground, you're going you're gonna to train wreck. So you're looking out at the horizon. Your feet and knees are together. You're getting ready to do your parachute landing fall. You've slipped against your relative motion. You're ready to go, and you hit the ground. You follow your training, and you make your your your, your, your multi-point uh, parachute landing fall. There's something they don't really tell you is going to happen, though, and you don't really understand it until the first time you experience it. Your descent is slow, 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 and then it's like the last probably 50 feet. It probably feels like 20, though. Every foot you go down, your speed seems like it increases. Now, your, actual, your speed of actual descent is pretty constant all the way down. Shit can happen. You can speed up, slow down, air currents. So but overall, you're probably, if you're you know descending at X feet per second, you're going to stay that way all the way down. But the relative motion of descent accelerates, 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 accelerates. And the last little bit is like, boom. And it hits you hard, man. The first time you hit, you're like, wow, I'm glad they did all this shit to me. I'm glad they made me roll around in the sawdust for three weeks before they let me do this. So I knew what I was doing, and I'm not hurt. It didn't feel good, but it didn't hurt, right? So I'm good. That's where I feel we are. We're at that point where at the, the relative appearance of motion seems to be picking up. Now, it's a constant motion. Like, this really started in earnest, 1971. When we cut the string to the last of the gold standard, this was an inevitable result but from 1971 and 1981, it didn't seem very fast. And from 1981 and 1991, it seemed like, oh, it's going to be okay. I mean, morning in America, thanks to Reagan, everything's better, you know? And then the 90s had all this new technology and all these marvels and great music. Last great decade is what I call the 90s. But the entire time, we were still descending. You just, like, you went through a nice, cool air column where everything felt great. 2024? You're on that terminal approach. Everything is going to appear to move more quickly now. Doesn't mean it's actually moving more quickly. The overall descent of the decline of our empire is constant since we made the decisions that led to the inevitability. But things are going to, we're going to hit an inflection point. And you're running out of time to get yourself emotionally, spiritually, and materially ready for it. So continue to build your knowledge, your food storage, your gardens, your community, everything that we talk about, because no one will do it for you. With that, let's go ahead and wrap up. I want to talk to you today about a way to store more food more efficiently, and that is with vacuum sealing. So the product that I have for you today is one that was just sent to me last week by Lavor. It is their DZ260 chamber vacuum sealer. Last two years ago, I decided to get a chamber vacuum sealer, and I'll explain why here in just a second. And I went on a quest to find, you know, without going to like a $8,000 machine, what was the best I could find? The VacMaster uh, P230 was the one that I selected, and it was it sells for about $1,100. I think at the time I bought it, uh, they've actually come down in cost because there's newer models and all now, but they were like $1,400. And I buy once, cry once is what I say. And I looked at a lot of lower cost vacuum chamber sealers and I'm like, nah, I'm going to rely on something I want to have, something I can trust. 
Vavor said they would send me one of these. And I was like, okay, maybe. And I said, let me check some things first. So I looked at the reviews and I looked at a lot of YouTubers with, you know, successful long-term channels. And what I look for is YouTubers that got one from Vavor. And like a year later, we're saying, let's check in. They were all happy. So I got this thing and they're like 440 bucks. And I'm like, if this thing is half as good as something three times as much, it's a good buy. I can nitpick on it. And I made a whole video about 10 minutes long. So I'm not going to say too much about it here today. You can watch the video if you want. But I, I said, I kind of feel stupid for spending as much as I did on mine at this point. The damn thing is great. And at 440 bucks, it's a buy. But right now, let me check to be sure because Vavor runs short-term sales. No, it's still on sale. Let me bring up this tab. 329 bucks. It is almost dimensionally the same as far as what it can handle as my vac master. There's a few nitpick things it can't do. Like if you're doing dry canning, you put one jar, not two. You can't put a half gallon jar in it. And it's a little bit shorter on the, the width dimension is the same. The length dimension, you have like a one inch less. Uh, so it's a little bit smaller bags. My cover for my vac master, I bought a custom cover for it because we keep it out in the outdoor kitchen. Fits it perfectly. It's on sale for 329 bucks. And you can get another 5% off. A good vacuum store is $100. The, the bags for these cost you less money because they don't have those stupid little ridges in them and stuff. I really recommend if you do not have a vacuum sealing solution that you get one of these at this price. And I usually I'm like, hey, you know, here's a good thing. This is what's nice about it if you want to get it. I'm strongly and right in line with today's show. Like being able to store food is really important. And there's a lot of other things it does. I'll leave it to the write-up for you. But the way you get that super cheap price, I mean, these are 440 bucks on Amazon right now. Number one, buy it from Vavor. Number two, if you do not have an account, set up an account. This is a member's price, but member just means you have an account. It's free. And then you'll get that price. When, and if you go to Vavor and you don't have an account and you want to check out as a guest, you'll pay the full retail. So they're actually incentivizing people to set up accounts with the sale. Then enter my discount code, which is in the write-up. And there's a link to the write-up in the video notes. If you're not listening to the audio right now, you can go over there and uh, use my discount code plus my link. And you get another 5% off. That makes this so freaking stupid cheap. Unless you already have one, I would get one. And I, if I have to say anything about his performance, if nothing else, the vacuum pump itself runs quieter than my much more expensive machine. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm saying it's damn good for the price. Excellent price to value ratio. And that's how I tell because I want you to preserve your wealth. So when you invest in something, the faster you get your ROI, the better. And if you do a lot of vacuum sealing right now, you're like using a food saver or something by paying two and a half points less or two and a half, two and a half times less for your bags, which is about what they cost. It'll pay for itself. Save food and all will help pay for it. Sous vide, it's a great tool for that. And there's a, just a tremendous amount you can do with one of them. The biggest thing is you can vacuum seal wet things. Where if you've ever tried to vacuum seal like a steak and it's not completely bone dry, what happens? The juice comes up in the bag. One drop gets in the seal. The seal fails. Now you're taking another expensive bag, one inside the... Oh, then you say curse words if you're me. I have just found everything in my life from a standpoint of food storage to be better since I got a vacuum uh, chamber machine. And if this had been available and I knew how good it was when I bought mine that costs over three times more, I would have bought this. So I can confidently recommend it to you. With that, hope you enjoyed today's show. We will be back tomorrow with another one where we'll be talking about gardening because that's what the poll said you guys wanted on X. I really recommend you tie into me on some level with social media. But if you really want to make sure you don't miss things like, guys, I put that out yesterday. We did the video yesterday. I was going to do the write-up, and I was going to put that vacuum machine out today. And I've had Vivor run sales on weekends. And I'm like, cool, I'll run that Monday. And Monday, it's gone. They do run sales on weekends only sometimes. And so I put that out on uh, Sunday. And if you're on Telegram, then you got an alert about it. You know what I got from, from Telegram? I Several people telling me, damn, Jack, I'm trying not to spend money right now. Right, Because they knew the deal was the kind of deal that you take when it comes along. 
So if you don't want to miss out on deals like that, follow us on social, consider becoming a member, use the discounts and get your money back and tell other people about the show. And if you're here on YouTube, please like our videos and subscribe to them and share them with others. Take care, guys. I'll catch you tomorrow.